so, um, if anyone doesn't know, my name's Luke Bond. Um, I've been making music now for about 14 years, I think, coming up now. Um, I've been with Armada for about four years, um, and I've been sort of mainly producing in like trance, progressive trance, and sort of other areas. I also done a lot of ghost producing as well, so I've worked across tons of different genres, drum and bass, hip hop, pop, uh, techno, all sorts of different styles. So as a result of that, I've kind of, my, my sort of personal sound and how I work is I'm very, I love to mix genres up. So I love taking in ideas, sounds, and things across a complete broad spectrum of different uh, styles of music. So this is a new, I'm, I was going to, I was going to think about dissecting one of my older tracks, but I figured this is a new track that I literally finished about a week ago. And it uses like a huge range. I've, I've implemented like a huge range of different styles into this. It's got trance in there. It's got big room in there. It's got techno in there. It's got melodic techno in there. So I figured it'd be a cool track to kind of like go through, dissect, and sort of explain how I, how I put it together. Um, so I'll play it to you first so you can kind of get a vibe for what it is. Um, and then once I've done that, I'll show you guys the whole process and everything I've done, how I like to put things together, and, and the mix and everything on it as well. So um, I'll play this for you guys first. Um, and then, yeah.
so yeah that's that um so yeah um you can hear like a lot of different styles in that track um i've never been kind of a producer that likes to pigeonhole myself into like one specific genre because i just find it boring like i just i get bored of stuff really quick so like i have to constantly kind of challenge myself as an artist to do things that i've not done on a previous track um, I know there's a lot of producers out there who can quite happily reproduce the same sound over and over. I am not one of those producers. So, um, yeah, so on this particular track, you can hear all sorts of stuff. I've got kind of a techno -y kind of big room intro. The leads has got all those sort of LFO automations on it that a lot of melodic techno guys are doing at the moment, which I really like. It's really cool. Um, and no one's really doing it in trance. So I thought, you know, why don't we bring that over from melodic techno and kind of make more of a trance package track with it. So, um, yeah, I'll break it down into kind of how I... Um, sort of start in Ableton, I, uh, I'm all for having the most optimized workflow as possible. I feel like it's really important that you can work quick because you could have a really good idea and if you can't manifest that idea quickly enough, a lot of the time you just forget about the idea and you don't end up doing anything with it. So you, like, I think it's super important um, to make sure you set up like you know yourself a good template. So when you start a new track, you've got your side chain set up. Uh, you got your master chain ready to go, so you can just jump in and start making music. Because um, I think one thing a lot of producers seem to struggle with is finishing tracks. Um, people come up with an idea, they start it, and then it's just they find it really hard to kind of finish it into something. So you end up with this whole folder just full of like half finished ideas all the time, which I I totally get. So I feel by like optimizing your workflow really helps with getting those ideas over the finish line. So at the top here, I've got. I got MIDI side chains. Um, I like to use MIDI because a lot of the time you've got these plugins out there like LFO Tool or Shaper Box or Kickstart, things like that. I personally use Kickstart um, that they don't always sync very well um, without a trigger, especially in Ableton. Um, I know for a fact if you use LFO Tool without like MIDI triggering, it's not always on time. So your side chains aren't always as tight as they could be. So what I do is I, I create two. I've got one MIDI side chain here which basically is just a kick. It's a really tight little uh, hit on the kick. That's literally just to kind of like allow me to create a side chain for just so I can allow the transient of the kick to punch through. It's not really too much for the ducking effect to give it that sort of pumping energy kind of feel. It's just more just there so you can dip the start of your leads, uh, your bass lines, just to make sure that initial transient of the kick can punch through because a lot of the time it can get lost. So there's that. Um, I've also got this another MIDI side chain as well that basically acts as like it's double the speed so if i want to make a quite a fast side chain where i kind of want to modulate something and make it kind of like dip quite quickly that's that there i don't always use it but it's there as an option if i want to um and also for ableton users out there it's kind of a pain in the ass to uh root midi into plugins because you've out of the box you've basically got to just make a midi channel for every time you want to use it on a plugin so what I do is I create an instrument rack um, in, as part of Ableton and I add an external instrument to it. And what you can do in the instrument rack is you can duplicate that as many times as you want. So you've got one MIDI channel and you can send this to as many instances of plugins as you want. So I've got it rooted here for, in just example on the, on the sub to Kickstart because um, I use Kickstart. I find Kickstart tends to be the best in terms of like accuracy. Um, it's not as powerful as other tools like LFO tool, but it, it does the job really well. So I, if you're going to use a sidechain plugin, I personally would recommend Kickstart for sure um, by Cable Guys and uh, Nicky Romero. Um, so yeah, I'll just kind of give you like a bit more of a breakdown of everything so you can hear sort of individual sounds, what I'm using to sort of put them together, how I process them and things like that. So the kick here is just like a, a, big, a big room kick. I'll just solo it real quick so you can kind of hear the, what the kick's like on its own. Nice and punchy, got a nice bit of body for it. Um, the kick's actually in F, and this track's in, I think it's in C sharp or D. When it comes to like tuning your kicks, I know a lot of people would be like, make sure your kick is the exact same key of the track. And for a lot of the time, that does make sense. But I feel like it varies massively depending on how thick the kick is or how much tail or body there is on it. If it's not too long, you, you're not going to have any issues using a kick in a different key. Like, if it's like a long kind of big room kind of kick, like a super long one, then you're gonna sort of hear sort of key clashes and stuff like that there. But uh, this kick's quite short, so I it sounds fine. Um, I like that. It sounds great, if anything, you know, with the, with the with the bass. Um, so I've got that going on. 
I've got sort of crash percussions, you know, your reverse cymbals, your crashes. Um, I like to use lots of little detail in my tracks, like reverse sounds, like, um, let's see what we got here, like a reverse effect. I'll show you this, like, I think this is from a Vengeance pack, I think. Yeah, this is a reverse piano. I really like using that on a lot of stuff because you can use your reverse reverbs as well, which I'll show you. But I like the re I like to use the reverse pianos just because it has that kind of like low mid tone to it that kind of like evens out the the frequency range of everything. So everything the, the reverses sound quite thick. It's really nice. Um, and just so you know, I I'm a huge I use samples all the time. I love using samples. Splice, Vengeance, Cashmere. I love the Cashmere packs. They're great. Um, I use all the ones that everyone likes to use. Like they, they sound awesome, and I, you know, why reinvent the real when there's people out there like really good sound designers creating these packs? They're there for you to take advantage of. So definitely use them. It's not going to make you any less of an original producer for sure, because you know, like t t people say, like, oh, you need to be unique and stuff. But you, you're being unique just by being you. Just by every little decision you make, you, you're making probably thousands of small decisions when you create a track and every one of those decisions is made by you. That's you being unique. I feel like a lot of people, when they try too hard to be someone else, they're not making those decisions based on what they want to do. They're making them purposely to sound like someone else. So just a lot of people say, oh, how do I be original? Just just do what naturally comes to your mind. What what comes to your mind when you do it? Make that decision. That's you being unique, you know? So um, for sure there. So uh, yeah. Um, with uh, sort of my build-ups and things like that, I do like to do quite big build-ups just because a lot of these tracks I like to sort of design for the main stages. Big build-ups work great on the main stages. Um, and I use various plugins and sort of fills. Um, I like to use, so I'll go through some of these ones on the, on the build-up here. Um, just leave that. So we've got this sort of isolated and I'll show you the sort of uh, sounds I've got in here. I start to add them up. So I've got a couple of little layers of um, Avenger. If anyone doesn't know what Avenger is, it's a really, really awesome synth um, that I use a lot. Um, I use it on practically everything now. It's probably my number one go-to synth. Um, it's by the, it's by Vengeance, um, and it's. It's made by the same guys who made Nexus. The, the only benefit over this, over Nexus, is Nexus is a very popular tool, but it's also a rompler, which means the sounds are basically samples. So it, they don't sound as good as a real synth, whereas this is an actual real synth. But you can also layer samples with it as well. So a lot of the expansions you can get for this are really well sound designed. Like the Future Wave one's amazing. Um, I, I have no shame in using these packs. They're great. And you can obviously do what you, you've got so many options to customize how they sound and the, the effect stack on them. Um, I use them all the time. It's definitely, it's just a great way to get your track sounding good out of the box. Um, if there's tools out there available, use them. Like there's so many plugins and sample libraries now more than ever. Um, the resources um, available to people. I'm a very resourceful producer. So I always like to, um, if there's tools available, I'm going to use it, you know. So. This build up's actually from Avenger. I think it's literally just a patch. And what I do is I just ex I render it into audio, into Ableton, so it's no longer being played off like one key on the synth. I throw it into Ableton and I can tweak it further from there. Um, I like to bounce a lot of things to audio because I feel like it, leaving it in MIDI, it makes it, it helps you commit to ideas. Like if you bounce something from MIDI to audio, it's now in audio. You can't customize it as much as you could when it was in MIDI form on a straight through a synthesizer. So it helps you kind of move forward with your project. You're like, okay, that's an audio now. I can't keep messing with that too much. Let's move on to the next part. Um, so bounce into it. And also it's great for controlling your mixes as well. Um, you know, like a lot of the simps, there'll be like reverbs and stuff like that hanging off them. And controlling reverbs are a pain. So if you put it into audio, you can just fade off the reverbs or cut them or it gives you a lot more sort of control. What I've actually started doing now with my mixes is once I finish the track, I'll just completely stem it. So it'll be fully stemmed, and then I'll put it back into Ableton, and I'll re sort of reorganize it, cut all the silences out, reorganize it as the track again, but everything is audio. And then at that point, you're kind of like, your mind goes from 
oh, I can add another idea or I can, you know, mess in with stuff. You kind of commit to the mix at that point, um, like a psychological thing. And you can really dial in on your mix. Um, you can cut off little reverbs. You can cut off any gaps in sound. You can really, really clean it up. So it sounds really punchy when it's, um, when it's finished up. So um, I haven't got to the point on this track yet because I, I literally finished this end of last week so I could play on ASOC yesterday. So um, yeah, it's pretty, pretty new. It probably won't be out, won't be out till early next year. So um, you're getting a pretty uh, exclusive peek on this. So yeah, I'll show you some more layers I've got going on here. More Avengers. Um, these are in audio as well. Sort of acid stabs. Need to fix a need to fix a crossfade on there because a little uh, audio pop, but um, yeah. So I really like a lot of the sounds in there. Um, you can use samples as well. You can get loads of cool acid samples in tons of sample packs, um, and pop them in there. Um, I'll see what else I've got going on. Let's have a look. Sometimes I do overcook my buildups a bit, but I, I just like big buildups. They're really fun to DJ with, and people go crazy when you drop the track. So <laughs> they're just fun. That's kind of like a top layer. I think that might be an audio as well. Yeah. And if you notice, I've actually put a sidechain on here with Kickstart. So you'll see what I mean. I've got Kickstart here, and it's set to MIDI mode. And it's that's that MIDI channel I had at the top. Um, is going straight into that and, and basically acting as a um, it's, it's not I don't really want the ducking effect too much on it It's just to give room for the kick um, You can use sidechain in, in millions of different creative ways But the most common way people use it is two reasons is to uh, use the kick as the chain So you want the sort of energy pumping effect and also it's a really good mixing tool because as, as you start adding more layers to your track um, that kick's gonna get hidden away. And the kick is probably the most important element of the track. It's the guy, it's like a metronome for the dancer, you know, for the listener, for the club. It's guiding them through the whole, you know, the rhythm of the track. So you want that kick to make sure it punches through. So you should really sort of focus on making sure that kick is looked after and everything else works around the kick. Um, sometimes you can oversight chain stuff and it can be, it can sound like a bit weird. So it is sometimes nice to have some things not be inside chained. Um, I don't sidechain everything. Um, you'll see in a moment as we get into the sort of the part where the kick is and the bass um, that uh, certain elements just breathe nicer without having any sort of dipping or anything on it. So I'll, uh, I'll give you some more elements here. What's this one here? G big hit. This I think this is a sample I stole off Gareth Emery about six years ago. I've been using it on every track since. It's great. Um, it's just basically like a build up and a impact. You know, another good thing I recommend as well, if there's like certain ways you like to build your tracks, just make a make a folder and and render each of your build ups into like a folder, so you've got them just to drag into your track. Um, I feel like things like little things like that really help you with finishing your tracks. Like you can, um, you want to make it easy for yourself to make music, make it as easy as possible. Because I feel like once you've kind of got all these things at your disposable, you tend to be more creative anyway. Because you've just got, oh, I've got that, I've got that, and then you, as you start adding them, more ideas start coming. You all oh, got an idea for this now, so you know having them at hand and very easily available. Like I, on the left here, where I've got all my projects, I've got all my Ableton projects back as far as 2019. I've got clips that I've made, a couple of clips recently that I made where I can just like, I made like a, a snare fill that was really inspired by like art bat stuff. I really like those big fills and it just goes to nothing and then it drops, you know. Um, I kind of remade that. I used it on this track as well actually, but I like using it on a few tracks. So I just drag it in and you've got this fill there ready to go with the automation on it and everything. Um, so there's loads of like little things you can do to really sort of speed up your workflow and get things done. And like, you know, when you get your track to a certain point, you can then, you've got enough in there, you can just spend a bit of time dialing in and sort of perfecting it at that point, rather than worrying about finishing it. Um, it's a much better place to be in rather than having like a 30% track with like loads of parts missing and whatnot. So here's the snares, um, let's have a look. So we've got a couple of build-ups here. I think this one's from a spinning sample pack. Yeah, from Splice. 
And then I've got a few more down here, but I think they're on a separate group. So let me just double check. They might be muted. Yeah, I like to layer my snare fills. Cause just I like to layer them all up. I do build a few of my snare fills myself, and then sometimes I'll just I use ones from sample packs because they just sound really good. Um, but then I'll kind of like lay them up with other snare fills and kind of do a few minor tweaks here and there to kind of differentiate it so it's not exactly the same. Um, there's loads of uh, really good snares. I, li I like, for years I used the cashmere snare fills a lot, but then cashmere packs are so popular, those snare fills become quite distinctive and you'll start hearing it in other tracks. You're like, okay, maybe it's time to change things up a little bit. So um, you can kind of mix it up there. I've got risers as well. So I've got a few risers from... Um, Let's have a listen to these ones here. So um, yeah, I love love risers. Um, I love layering them up as well. You'll find a lot of the time if you want to make your own risers, they're really easy to make. You just get like a, a key in like serum or something, like a really basic synth, and you just basically pitch it up an octave. So you hold the note down for let's say eight bars, start it at zero, do a plus twelve. Uh, pitch bend on it to go to the top and you could maybe even automate the amount of reverb that has on it as it progresses um, there's loads of ways you can make fill they're really easy to make you could even add like an LFO to it or like a auto pan and kind of make it modulate it and like automate the speed of the LFO as it goes up um, there's cool ways I've done that on a couple of bits in this track actually so I'll move forward because we are pressed for time so I will start moving forward a bit on this now so I'll get us into the drop so you can kind of see how my bass lines put together these and then I'll get to the leads and sort of all the main elements now so um, let's get to the bass Kind of like I kind of keep in this bass line quite filtered down. I don't want it to interfere too much with the top. If you notice how complicated that melody is with all these sort of automations on it, I don't want a crazy groovy bass line clashing with it because it's just, just too much going on. It'll just it'll just be overwhelming to listen to. So I'll set this here. You can hear it kind of in conjunction with the kick, and I'll just break it down real quick. So I've got a few layers. Um, first of all, I've got a sub. It's a really big sub that I think I rendered out of Serum. I like doing all my subs in audio. Um, I like having them just as a, a WAV file. And then what I do is I throw it into Ableton. I avoid, I avoid using any, in this particular case, I've, I've just used um, pitch warping. So I, rather than using like a warping algorithm where you've got like, you know, the complex, you've got the beats, complex pro, whatnot. Obviously you're gonna get quality degradation when you're doing that. Um, with a sub bass, what I like to do is, I, I think with this one, it was one I made in Serum. And I made a really, I just recorded it like a long note, really long, like several, 10 seconds or so. So you've got loads of, loads of sub. Bounced it into audio. And then what I do now is I put it into my tracks and then I just sort of pitch, I sort of just pitch bend it in Ableton, but just using the re-pitch. I don't use any algorithm stretches. And obviously when you do that, the length of the sample will change, but because I've rendered such a long sample of it, if I pitch it quite high up, I still got plenty of sub there and I can just loop it or whatnot. Uh, I just find using subs in audio, they just sound more consistent when you go down the frequencies. Uh, subs really kill off when you start getting down to like E, D sharp, um, and they can be a bit of a pain to get them to sort of resonate in those frequencies. So at that point, I tend to like use like harmonic distortion and things like that to kind of keep them sounding quite sort of sort of prominent in the mix when I make those key changes. 